Welcome back everyone, today we're taking a look at the Fuji X-T4, a hybrid shooter's dream camera or a promising camera which ultimately ends in disappointment. Let's find out. The Fuji X-T4 has a 26 backside illuminated APS-C X-Trans sensor. That is a mouthful. <laughs> it's got IBIS, which means in-body image stabilization, and more on this later, but it's the main selling point of this camera. It can record in 4K 60fps max in either UHD or DCI. For those of you who don't know, DCI is a slightly higher resolution than, than standard uh, UHD 4K. Uh, and has a different aspect ratio. It's a bit more cinematic looking. 1080p video recording up to 240 frames per second, which means slow motion up to 10 times. It's got a fully articulated touchscreen display. It's got a 3.68 million dots electronic viewfinder with 100 FPS refresh rate as well. Dual UHS-2 SD card slots. It's got a new and improved battery with 2200 mA, which is almost twice the size of the X3 3 one. And a USB Type-C connector, which allows um, power delivery charging. In a nutshell, the X-T4 looks and feels amazing. It's not too big, not too small. Although it is compact, it doesn't feel toyish in any way, weighing about 607 grams. And in my hands at least, it fits perfectly. It has weather sealing as well, which means you can use it in any situation. Of course, you can now notice it has a fully articulated touchscreen display, which was previously one of those rather awkward tilting only to a certain degree ones. Uh, the buttons and dial situation is great, Fuji is known for having a lot of tactile dials for most of the settings that you'll ever need. It's basically covered in customizable buttons and wheels. And customizable is a key word here, because you can really choose which button does what. Besides the three dials on top, which you don't have to use if you don't want, we also get two function FN buttons, um, two scroll wheels on front and back, which can be pressed as well, a keypad and a joystick for choosing uh, AF points among other more standard buttons. The LCD screen is uh, as good as any other cameras really, um, nothing special here. The EVF though is one of the better ones with those 3.68 million dots and 100 uh, FPS uh, refresh rate. And more importantly, it doesn't suffer from blackout. This is uh, something that older uh, mirrorless cameras uh, really uh, had as an, as an issue and uh, it's pretty frustrating. Um, although the resolution is nothing groundbreaking since uh, Sony's new cameras have even 9 million uh, dots. The battery life is now more than decent. Uh, one complaint uh, people had with the X-T3 was the poor battery life, uh, but that has been improved quite a bit since the battery is almost twice the size now and is rated at 500 shots. The port selection we have here is a USB Type-C with power delivery, which uh, with the included adapter doubles as a headphones input uh, as well. Micro HDMI, remote and mic input. On the other side we have the double SD cards bay and uh, the door comes off. In theory at least you can now hot swap the cards. I haven't tried it though. Also, it passes my accessibility test with uh, top marks because it's really easy to get to both your SD cards and the battery on the bottom when it's uh, mounted on a tripod. So big thumbs up there. The final point I'd like to make about uh, the ergonomics of this camera is uh, the separation between stealth and uh, movie mode, which exists on other cameras, yes, but on this extends to the menus as well, meaning you'll have separate settings and uh, you won't mess them up each time you're switching from photo to video. I'll be the first to admit, I was a bit anxious switching from Canon's amazing dual pixel AF to Fuji's. Um, and especially now, since Canon and uh, Sony have been releasing uh, 
continuously uh, new incredible cameras which have this black magic like uh, powerful skills of uh, pet eye uh, and bird's eye AF which work really really well. Uh, there isn't any such things here on the Fuji, there is only human eye AF and human face uh, which work really well, I'm using it right now. Uh, well, if, you, if it doesn't, uh, you'll be able to tell. But yeah, my uh, beginning of the video conclusion about the AF is that it works good. It, it hasn't disappointed... Uh, <coughs> It hasn't disappointed me yet, and uh, I will let you know if, uh, if anything changes in the meanwhile. Besides that, Fuji is known to release software updates pretty often, um, much more often than uh, other manufacturers, I'd say. So you can expect some if improvements down the line. Um, I have updated the camera twice already and the lens uh, once, I think. But speaking of that uh, cinematic autofocus um, in video, uh, well, they do offer a lot of uh, customization and you can change the sensitivity of the autofocus if you are noticing that uh, the AF is hunting a bit back and forth. Uh, you can change the sensi sen sensitivity to be a bit less so. Um, and also, that is a lot more dependent on the lens that you're using than the body itself. Uh, I'm using it with the 16 to 80 which is one of the newer Fuji lenses and so it should be one of the best ones for video AF uh, as well. Um, but I'll get into a lot more details about this lens in a separate video because there's a lot to talk about it so uh, yeah stay tuned for that. What I can say is that with, uh, with this combo with the Fuji X-T4 and the 16 to 80 mil f4 uh, lens haven't noticed any kind of uh, hunting while uh, autofocusing so yeah it's it's been uh, behaving quite quite well but you if you are using older lenses and you let them uh, uh, focus on their own uh, your mileage may vary the X-T4 also provides a cool set of tools to assist you with manual focus as well, like focus peaking, which is useful. And a thing I would suggest you to do if you want to manual focus is uh, switch the focusing to linear. It will really help you be able to replicate the same uh, movements uh, over and over again if you if you want to focus pull. Another tip I have for you is to set your camera to performance boost mode. What I use is the EVF boost and uh, what this does is it uh, maxes out the refresh rate to 100 and FPS but not only that it also increases the speed of your autofocus which uh, is something you might really want and it does that at not so much of a battery cost. Uh, now this is a big one and for some people it's worth it to upgrade from the X-T3 to the X-T4 just for this feature alone. Because think about it, let's say you have some older prime lenses which don't have image stabilization in them. Now all of a sudden, uh, even in low light situations when both for photo and for video, these lenses become quite usable. Let me interrupt this program with an important message from myself. Uh, if you are enjoying this video so far, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It takes a lot of time and effort to do this and uh, it really helps. So thanks and cheers. It promises 6.5 stops of image stabilization and it can even pair up with the lens optical image stabilization and work together for even better results. I have tested this and uh, it's pretty impressive. You can get usable results with even half a second of uh, exposure time which on other cameras and uh, lenses would mean a blurry mess of a photo. So uh, some of the things that we want to test are the eye autofocus, the autofocus of course, uh, the image stabilization, the built-in one and uh, yeah just a couple of things and uh, first we're going to test those in a vlogging scenario and see how that goes but then uh, we're going to test them in uh, multiple scenarios and situations. I'll just take a few steps. Uh, this is with the uh, image stabilization both from the camera and the uh, lens. And uh, let me switch it off now. Now let's take a look how it looks without any kind of stabilization. 
should be a bit shakier, uh, but uh, might not be a big difference uh, either because that image stabilization isn't necessarily for this. Don't get the wrong idea, the IS works great for video too, completely removing micro jitters even on the non-stabilized lenses as I mentioned. However, in my opinion, I think where it shines is mostly on handheld standing shots. It's really effective at stabilizing your footage. It even has an IS boost mode, but it introduces some cropping and from my testing, the standard IS is more than enough. However, you should have realistic expectations from it. This is not meant to be a gimbal replacement by any means, so yeah, keep that in mind. Okay, I think it's pretty safe to say that I was uh, late, but... I did not miss it. <laughs> and uh, while the Fuji does its thing, I'd, uh, I just uh, want to talk to you about sunrises and how it's never a sure thing and you never know if you won't be able to see the sun at all because it's cloudy or something. And uh, believe me, I know how hard it is to wake up early. I'm not a morning person at all, but unless you do try, I guess you will really never know. So uh, yeah, just make an effort and uh, go out and shoot. And right now we are beginning to see the sun, so I'll let you uh, watch a beautiful, hopefully, time lapse. See ya. So uh, let's go test out some other things as well. Hopefully the autofocus works. I, I turned on the uh, eye autofocus and this one is in shadow, of course. Uh, as you can see, hope it's focusing, but yeah, we'll find out some things. Fujifilm's X-Trans sensor is uh, obviously a crop sensor one, but it's backside illuminated, which means better low light performance, uh, which is usually a concern for uh, crop sensors. Also, their X-Trans sensors are built in-house by th themselves and are quite different than uh, traditional Bayer sensors, which you would find in most other cameras. And uh, they have been developing this for quite a bit of time now. And uh, why they did this is to uh, solve some problems that traditional sensors have, such as Moiré, for example. And without getting too technical and nerdy about it, this is a color aliasing artifact which appears sometimes and, and how this is eliminated in Bayer sensors is with an optical low pass filter put in front of the sensor, which is great because it solves the issue, right? Well, yes, but also in the process it uh, reduces sharpness overall. So because they have a different pixel layout and they don't have to use this uh, filter, uh, this should mean for Fuji that their photos are sharper. 
and indeed, there is no lack of sharpness with this sensor. And I've said it before, 26 megapixels is the sweet spot for me, which means you will have plenty of resolution and the possibility to crop in and post-processing, and also not having huge file sizes. The image quality in my opinion is exceptional, both for stills and for video, having a good color reproduction and good dynamic range. Also, I can't not mention this, but the JPEGs straight out of the camera are so beautiful and uh, better than what I'm used to. Uh, and it really made me shoot a lot more JPEGs, which I never used to do. Uh, well, except with my phone, you know, or at least a RAW plus JPEG, which is something you can do with uh, any camera. But because they look so good, uh, it makes the entire process a lot easier and f more fun. I mean, Yes, editing your photos is something we all do uh, as photographers, but sometimes you, you don't want to have to do it to be able to use your photos, right? Uh, so having an image from the camera which you can directly post to Instagram or Facebook or whatever you do, you can even print it, uh, is, is quite, quite nice. So with that being said, I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, the Fuji color science does not disappoint. And that's a good thing because, uh, well, they are known for that after all. And, uh, you know, Fuji fans will talk about uh, their uh, color reproductions and film simulations uh, all day and all night. And speaking of that, Fuji has some really cool film simulations, which are kind of like color profiles, let's say. Some of my favorites are Provia, which has beautiful contrast and saturation, but not overdoing it. Astia, which has softer colors. Eterna, which is a lot more neutral, with less contrast and more shades of grey, which means you will preserve a lot more details in black usually, and that makes it perfect for video color grading too, because you can bring back details from the shadows. And Classic Chrome, which is pretty vintage, uh, very contrasty, but saturation is subdued. I really like this one, and also, let me know if I should release a full version of the vintage fluffiness, but until then, here's a trailer for it. So let me show you the differences between the profiles. This is Eterna. This is Provia. This is Classic Chrome. And this is F-Log footage. F-Log footage is really great if you want to edit uh, your, uh, your video. Think of it like uh, a RAW file compared to a JPEG uh, for, for photos. So filming in, uh, in F-Log or log footage in general uh, is the best choice you have if you want to edit uh, your video a lot, like, uh, I don't know, exposure, uh, bringing back uh, details from the shadows, uh, even colors and, uh, and other details. Uh, it's the best shot you have with uh, with video files. Think of it like um, or a raw type file uh, versus JPEGs for for photos. It's kind of like that, but yeah, not all the way uh, full raw. It's capable of uh, 15 frames per second with a mechanical shutter for stills, which sounds like this. Yeah, that's, that, that's silent and uh, a very nice sounding shutter. Uh, if, and if that's not enough for you, you need to check yourself, mate. But if that's not enough for you, uh, Fuji does offer 20 FPS with an electronical shutter or 30 FPS, I mean, we're talking about movie. Uh, no, but they're, they are stills. 30 FPS in stills, but the autofocus doesn't work. So uh, you do have quite some compelling options. 
So this is totally appropriate for sports use or any dynamic shots you might have. Even just with the mechanical shutter with those 15 FPS, the electronic one isn't desirable in uh, most cases because of uh, rolling shutter on most cameras and also uh, bending uh, in weird lit uh, scenes and uh, scenarios. Also, a very annoying issue present on uh, most mirrorless cameras until uh, recently was the EVF blackout. Uh, and this happened uh, basically whenever you take a photo. So whenever you take a photo, you would stare at a black uh, screen for a brief uh, second. Well, it's not really a second, but it would probably felt like a second. So as you can imagine, this is quite a problem and yes you are uh, for example taking uh, 15 frames per second 15 photos but also staring at uh, some black screen in between all those uh, shots and as you can imagine that was a real problem for uh, sports photographers or wildlife photographers and it means that you can't really track your subject that well for example i don't know it's a bird flying off and you, you keep the shutter button down and uh, take some burst photos, but uh, that, that blackout kind of throws you off and you, you won't be able to do much with it. So that's one main reason why uh, sports and wildlife photographers uh, didn't switch from uh, DSLRs for a long time. But the good news is, as I uh, previously mentioned, that new mirrorless cameras uh, don't suffer from this anymore and this is the case for the X-T4 as well. I haven't seen any uh, EVF blackout so that's a really good thing. About the raw files, uh, they're pretty good and you can get back quite a few details both from the shadows and the highlights and um, every everything in between. Uh, although I find them a bit big at around 50 megabytes per file. I don't know, for, for this resolution 26 megapixels doesn't seem like a huge resolution. Um, but this is in a raw uncompressed. There is also a lossless compressed uh, raw version which will have the size at around 25 megabytes and in theory at least uh, you won't be losing any kind of details or information. There's also a third option which is a compressed um, uh, version but I would stay away from that. This was the main reason why I was interested in the X-T4 and I'm probably not the only one, but it packs such powerful video capabilities. It's got zebras, no, not that kind, this kind, to show you what's overexposed, uh, focus peaking and many, many other tools. You could use this to shoot a full movie, especially if you make a small rig out of it. Uh, you could uh, put it on a gimbal or, uh, I don't know, throw some cinema lens on it and you're good to go. I'll most likely not do it justice in this video, but the image quality is amazing. Uh, both on the X-T3 and the X-T4 really, because they are the same, except uh, the X-T4 comes with that IBIS and a uh, flippy screen and a better battery, which kind of make a huge difference, you know, uh, practically speaking. Uh, and also you have that uh, 240 FPS if you want uh, slow motion.
uh, like I said, it shoots 4K DCI or 4K UHD up to 60 FPS and you can choose a bitrate up to 400 megabits, which uh, means a lot of details. I honestly wouldn't go over 200 though because the file size gets so huge and the difference isn't perceivable unless maybe you do some heavy post-processing, I don't know. For my video nerds out there, it can shoot 420 10-bit internally and 422 10-bit externally. You can choose between H.265, H.264 and MP4 file formats, the first being the most advanced one but heavy on your computer when it's time to edit, and the last one the easiest one. You can choose the movie compression as well, uh, all intra or long GOP, and you can shoot in F-Log or HLG, which is simply put somewhere in between shooting normally and uh, shooting log in terms of dynamic range and uh, details you can uh, recover. I don't want to get more in details than this on the video side because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, so if you guys are interested, let me know and I'll make a dedicated video just for the uh, video options that, sh that Fuji offers because there's a lot. But the last thing I'll mention about video is, uh, I think, uh, is this has F-Log Assist, which is really cool because uh, shooting in uh, log kind of sucks because everything is so washed out and gray, it's hard to even tell what's uh, exposed, what's not, uh, unless you're using zebras. So what this does is it overlays a film simulation uh, on your screen so you can uh, better see what you're shooting, but it will actually record and save on your SD card the log version. And something I was wondering before getting the ca this camera, and uh, you might as well, is do you really need those uh, UHS-2 SD cards because they are really expensive, like five times the, the price of uh, regular SD? And short answer is uh, no. I have tested it in the highest uh, settings. Uh, for, the, for example, in video, I was recording at 400 megabits per second in uh, 4K and there wasn't any issue, there wasn't any uh, lesser limits of recording or anything like that. So yeah, I wouldn't worry, you are good with the um, UHS-1, but make sure you have um, good ones because uh, there are many different brands out there and not all are, are as good. I've uh, always uh, been using SanDisk and uh, I've always been happy with their, uh, with their cards. And on top of that, uh, with the X-T4 you can write to both cards simultaneously, even video. So uh, that's really great for uh, backup purposes, so photogs rejoice. But yeah, probably the only reason why you might want to have UHS-2 and have those higher speeds is uh, actually for photo, not for video. Uh, if you are taking many, many, many photos, uh, you know, it, it takes a while to write all those photos to your SD card. So. Uh, the buffer will fill up and you won't be able to, to, to take uh, more photos for a few seconds. So having UHS-2 will help with that. By the way guys, if you want me to cover a particular subject more in depth, uh, like, I don't know, time lapses, because we've done a few in this video, uh, what's in my camera bag, uh, what Fuji uh, video options you have, um, I don't know, uh, what mics I use, uh, drones, whatever, please do let me know in the comments below. Okay, I think it's time to address the elephant in the room here. However cool this camera might be, it doesn't have a full frame sensor, which means at the end of the day, many people won't even consider it. And they'll probably tell you that a pro camera has to have a full frame sensor because that automatically means better image quality, better low light performance, and that full frame look. Uh, which uh, doesn't really have anything to do with the sensor, but more with the lens, which means you can achieve the same effect with the right lens on crop as well. And hearing so many people say these things again and again, uh, these were my concerns as well. I'd be lying if I had said anything else. But suffice it to say that this little sensor uh, has really impressed me. 
And all of the concerns I listed above aren't necessarily false, but they are vastly and grossly exaggerated. It depends more on the scenario. It's not always as simple as bigger is always better. Yes, in some ways, uh, traditionally, the bigger the sensor, the more light and information you can capture. But it's not always that simple. For example, in the cinema world, there is the Super 35 uh, format, which is really close to crop sensor in size, but is really popular and has a desired look. But for most people, having a crop sensor means the camera is smaller, the lens is smaller and therefore lighter. Another reason why someone might prefer crop over full frame sensor is that uh, crop factor basically, that 1.5 magnification you get with your uh, lenses. And it's easy to imagine how many people and photographers would uh, would desire such a feature. For example, wildlife photographers will have more reach with the same focal length. Uh, they'll basically have times 1.5, so they can get closer to the action, closer to the bird or the animal or whatever. Uh, but also for anyone who travels really, because uh, they'll have more reach with less. Uh, that means uh, lighter weight lenses. It can mean that you have to bring fewer lenses with you because you have more reach with what you have already. Conclusions. Is this the best camera out there? No, but I don't think there is such a thing. But that being said, uh, this gets pretty damn close. And if not the best camera, for me at least, it's the best crop sensor camera that money can buy. Weather sealed, compact and light, but packing such high-end features. I don't think there is any type of photographer or videographer out there who couldn't practically use this camera if he wanted to. It's that good. To me, this is the perfect example of a hybrid camera with both great photos and great video capabilities, which we've come to expect from our modern cameras uh, nowadays. If I were to nitpick, uh, well, some people would have uh, really liked a dedicated uh, headphone jack. Uh, other people don't really like the flippy screen for uh, photos. Um, others would have really liked a full frame sensor, but yeah, that's basically why we'll never have the perfect camera, the ultimate perfect camera, because everyone wants something different. Uh, for me, I would have just liked a longer cable included in the box uh, and uh, maybe a dedicated battery charger. Also, the X-T4 wasn't made to replace the X-T3, the latter one is still being manufactured and sold and it's about uh, $300 cheaper. So if you think the IBIS uh, flippy screen and uh, way better battery life aren't such important things to you, although I imagine they are, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can, you can save a few bucks there because otherwise they are pretty much the same camera. Uh, some might say that the X-T4 is more of an improvement, an, an upgrade for videographers than photographers. And that may be true, but I think the IBIS will really help photographers as well and uh, the other features which we have uh, already uh, went over. And another upgrade which I didn't uh, mention till now is the uh, shutter life expectancy, which, which uh, has, a, has doubled the life now from 150,000 to 300. So uh, that's uh, really, really good and uh, very pro level uh, camera like. So in the end, all I can do is uh, congratulate you if you already have this camera. If you are considering it, I hope this was helpful. If you already have the X-T3, maybe it's not worth the upgrade, I don't know. That's for you to decide uh, now that you have all the info. And please let me know in the comments below what impression did this camera leave on you. Thanks for watching and uh, I'll catch you in the next one.